a session on and this is actually an opportunity for members also to get uh, clarified on various uh, topics and uh, uh, like today being uh, i think 67th session we've been doing this session month over month to have an informative and educative on the gst friends as you know gst when it started no, it was a conglomerate of uh, VAT, service tax, excess, and other laws. Pretty simple and uh, easy law. Even today, I would say it is uh, it's definitely pretty simple and easy. But over the time, when the notifications are coming and the clarifications that are coming, some of the clarifications which are kind of having a retrospective effect, the impact of it. I'm sure each one of you would have faced either a GST audit under Section 65 or would have received some ASMT 10 notice on mismatches. Or some of you would have received some emails from your vendors asking uh, whether you are an MSME, whether is the invoice is applicable or not. Sometimes the organization goes through a change where the change would be change in an accounting software or the accountant who has been handling would have changed. So whenever these changes that happens, whether by way of notification, by way of software, by way of the people, it's also essential that we get updated regularly what's happening. And indirect access, whenever there is any mistake that happens, the cost of rectifying is little high because it's a straight percentage on the top line. And the challenge that comes up is if that was not covered back to back with the customer. Say I'm collecting at 12% and suddenly someone says, no, no, it's 18%. 6% of the turnover, sometimes it may eat away the profits or net worth too. Contrarily, if it is on input tax credit, some credits have been availed considering they are eligible, which turns out to be ineligible. Or you have availed on the strength of the invoice while the same has been reversed by the supplier or not appearing in 2B. After five years, it's like we have now more or less settled, convinced that this is the law, this is how it will happen. Now the changes that are coming are in the returns and the form. Like more or less everyone knows table three is on liability, four is on input tax credit, but now suddenly there are some more tables that are getting introduced. And last year we saw little extended version of 3B. Most likely a bigger version of 3B is going to come in the next year. GSTR1, we are happy with 13 tables, two more tables that got added. So these are the changes that are happening frequently. All this while we were settled that, okay, I will not take input tax credit basis the invoice. I will wait and check whether it is there in 2B, only then I will take. But now with the introduction of section 38, even the credit appearing in 2B might be a restricted credit, right? Or if everything is good, I have availed the credit, but we have rule 88 where they are saying that, no, you cannot use uh, full credits. So, over the time, there are complications that are coming into the law. So if we are not updated, we might end up doing some mistakes and which will become costly. So our endeavor is always to bring the knowledge to give the, our participants up to date. And we as a finance professionals, we deal in with Excel or some of the reporting tools like PPT and others. We also have a constant endeavor that we uplift, we upgrade our knowledge on the tech. So every month, we also have a tech corner where we will introduce you a new flavor of reporting and a new flavor of working in a better way. In today's tech corner, uh, I'm going to introduce one of my colleagues, Tarun, who will walk us through on how we can, how effectively we can start using Power BI. Now, uh, we've been taking more many sessions on Excel on Microsoft Power Query. Power BI, the M language, 
Now this is uh, next level. As the organization scale up, where the volume of transactions are high, and you want to do analysis, you need to have little additional tools to have this. So with me today, we have three speakers. I have Ashika, my colleague, and Jagdish, who will walk us through in the first session on the aspects related to GST, which are recent updates, and more so, what are all the things that you have to take care of because a new year has started for us. They will be taking us through that. And uh, we will be taking the questions as and when you have any questions, take, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat box. In the interest of everyone, uh, you have been muted. So at, uh, at an appropriate time, you will have an option to unmute yourself and ask the questions. Right? And post the GST session, we will be taking on the tech aspect of it. I'm there throughout the session and feel free to ask any questions you have on the subject that we have been discussing today. If it is little on the GST, but not on the subject, at the end, we still have the Q&A. We'll take some other questions too, yeah? And on this note, let us start the session, welcoming both the speakers, Ashika and Jagdish, over to you. Uh, Jagdish, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen just yes. a second. Yes. Yeah. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the agenda of today's session is uh, the amendments proposed in the Finance Act 2023 and the uh, updates on amnesty scheme and GST health check for financial year 2022-23 and how to get ready for 23-24. First, we'll see the Finance Act 2023 amendments. First, just a second. Yeah. The first amendment relates to the composition scheme. Section 10 deals with the composition scheme. So as you all know, the small taxpayers whose turnover up to 1.5 crores can opt for the composition scheme, subject to certain conditions and restrictions. One of such uh, condition is that the taxpayer shall not uh, make the supply of goods or services to the e-commerce operator. So if we make the uh, supplies to the e-commerce operator, then he is not eligible to opt for the composition scheme. But now what, uh, uh, what amendment has made in the section 10 is they have removed the words goods. So now even the taxpayer who is supplying the goods through the e-commerce operator can opt for the uh, composition scheme. So still uh, the restriction on supplier of services through the e-commerce operator is there. So uh, this is the summary of the previous slide. Before uh, amendment, uh, there is a restriction on both supplier of goods and services. Uh, both are not eligible to opt for the composition scheme. But now, after the post amendment, uh, there is a restriction only on the service provided. Whereas supplier of the goods, the e-commerce of even if he supplies the goods to the e-commerce operator, he is uh, uh, allowed to opt for the composition scheme. So here, I would like to have one more point: is that section ten, subsection two, uh, restrict the supplier of the goods who is making the interstate supplies. So if any supplier of, if any taxpayer who is making the interstate supplies is not allowed to opt for the composition scheme. Even if he uh, supplies goods through the e-commerce operator, then also he is not allowed to uh, opt for the composition scheme. So some in substance is that he can uh, opt for the composition scheme only if he make the interstate supplies through the e-commerce operator. So uh, coming to coming to the uh, section 16. So there is a specific provision in section 16 that if the uh, sub, uh, the recipient fails to make the payment to the supplier within 180 days from the date of receipt of the invoice, then the input tax credit availed by that recipient shall be added to the output tax levy. Actually, uh, this proviso has been drafted based on the earlier written filing system. But those uh, that are GSTR 1, GSTR 2, GSTR 3, but uh, those have not implemented those are all those returns. 
if he if the recipient fails to make the payment to the supplier one eight days there is a specific table in the gst r2 where we need to report those transactions on which payment has not been made to the supplier in that table that will be added to the output tax liability but now uh, there is no such system so in order to align with the current return filing system as of now there is only gst r1 and gst r3 so in order to align with the current return filing system they have amended this section they have now uh, the reference to the output tax liability has been removed in the provision to uh, second provision to section 16 subsection 2 so now uh, C ITCM CSR expenditure. This is one of the most hot topic from the last few years. So section 17, subsection 5 of CJST Act lists down the blocked credits on which ITC cannot be claimed. Now to this list, new clause has been added. That is ITC on uh, CSR expenditure cannot be availed. So from now onwards, ITC uh, on expenditure, which are incurred under the obligation of the uh, CSR Act, uh, corporate social responsibility, is not been allowed. Yeah, now from now onwards, it is a blocker credit. That is the uh, ineligible. It is, we cannot uh, take the ITC on CSR expenditure. So in the pre-GST regime, uh, sunward credit uh, uh, allowed on CSR expenditure in the matter of SR Pro Pack as a commissioner of the CGST Act. Uh, even uh, whereas in the GST regime, in the initial days of implementation, ITC on CSR expenditure had disallowed. But recently, various advanced rulings uh, have concluded that ITC on CSR expenditure uh, is eligible. They have allowed the ITC on CSR expenditure. So, in order to like, uh, negate the legal presence set by various forms, forums, and courts, the government has proposed to amend the CGST Act uh, to block the credit on CSR expenditure. Sir, would you like to add anything, sir, here? Okay. Sorry. So, uh, there are uh, two points to ponder here. Now, this is, if you read the entry, it says, Corporate Social Responsibility referred to Section 135 of the Companies Act 2013. So, what if the CSR is spent by other than corporate? Because 17 subsection 5, is a blocked credit and the credit is now saying that it is for corporate. So a point for people to think, I'm not giving an answer at this point, but I want you to keep this question in the mind. Second, this is the Finance Act amended. So if at all the entry has come now, what about the CSR activity which has been spent till date by the corporates who have availed the credit, would that credit be eligible? Okay. I'm not going to give the answer, but I want you to think. And uh, of course, I would like to hear Jagdish and Ashika's views at the end uh, on this point. But yes, this is something which you have to consider. And there is CSR is a mandatory spend. It's not that the corporate exactly spends the same amount. There is an amount which corporate spends little over and above the CSR spend given by the company set. Would that also take this coloration of this? is uh, the three points that uh, we would like to discuss and uh, uh, we'd like to hear the answer from the participants then i'll share our views otherwise please continue okay moving on to the next uh, section 17 subsection 3 so at per section 17 subsection 2 the itc which is attributable to both uh, taxable supplies and exam supplies then such common ITC is required to be reversed in proportion to the exempted turnover. So, uh, if you see the explanation uh, to the section 17, subsection 3, uh, the exempt supply shall not include the Schedule 3 transactions except para 5 of the Schedule 3. Uh, as we know that Schedule 3 transaction being neither a supply of goods nor supply of services not covered under the exempt supply. But only for the purpose of reversal under this section, these non gst supplies shall be considered as an exempt supply. So, uh, uh, para 5 is already there. That is the sale of land and building. Now, to this, one more is added. That is the para 8 of the Schedule 3. That is 
uh, sale of warehouse goods uh, before filing the expound bill of entry. That uh, that means inbound sales. Now, these two non-GST supplies are required to add it to the exempt supply for the purpose of uh, reversal of common ITC. So, para 5 is already there. That is the sale of land and building. And para 8A, inbound sales, sale of warehouse of goods. Before clearing for home consumption, this still needs to be added to the exempt supply. So, coming to the section 23, exemption from registration. Uh, section 22 provides the turnover limit to get registered under the GST law, whereas section 23 provides the category of uh, persons who are required to mandatorily register under the GST Act. So now coming to the section 23, section 23 uh, provides the uh, category of persons who are not liable to uh, take the registration under the GST. We'll see who are all other persons. Persons who, is, who are exclusively engaged in supplying of non-GST supplies and supplying of wholly exempted, uh, wholly exempted goods and services. Uh, this category of persons are not required to uh, take the registration under the GST Act, even if it, uh, uh, yeah, even if the turnover exceeds as prescribed under Section 22. And an agriculturist, to the extent of supply of produce out of cultivation of land, these two category of persons are not are not required to uh, take the registration under the GST Act. Whereas coming to the Section 23, Subsection 2, those persons, as may be notified by the government, are not required to take the registration under the GST Act. Now, the, what the amendment proposed is, they have added the non outstanding clause to the Section 23, Subsection 2. Actually, uh, the Finance Bill 2023 has proposed uh, uh, proposed to insert the non outstanding clause to the whole Section 23. Uh, that is, Section 23 will have the war rating effect for Section 22 and Section 24. But on recommendations of the 49 GST Council, uh, they have provided the non abstentic clause only to the Section 23, subsection, uh, subsection 2. Therefore, only those notified persons as, uh, are not required to take the registration in GST, even if they are required to take the registration under Section 22 or uh, section 24. That's the compul compulsory registration. Now moving on to the next section, section 56. Section 6, 56 provides for interest in case of delay uh, in refund beyond 60 days from the date of appl uh, refund application under section 54, subsection 1. Uh, if uh, interest has not been sanctioned within 60 days from the date of uh, uh, refund application, then interest uh, at the rate uh, interest uh, at the rate not exceeding six percent has to be uh, given by the department to uh, the refund who have filed the refund application. So here they have not changed the time limit in the amendment. So the proposed amendment intends to provide a basis of calculation of interest on delayed refund in such manner, and conditions have been added. So now uh, post amendment. Section 56 provides for an enabling provision to prescribe manner of computation of period of delay for uh, calculation of interest on delayed refunds. So there is no change in the time limit, only they have uh, inserted uh, certain conditions and manner of uh, com uh, computation, manner of computation of delay and calculation of interest thereof. Now, uh, this is the new section. This is the uh, section for penal provisions on e-commerce operator. We'll see what's uh, what are the penal provisions here. So, if any e-commerce operator allows to supply goods and services through him, uh, sorry, uh, through it by an unregistered person, other than a person exempted from uh, registered person by way of notification. So, if he allows any unregistered person uh, who is not uh, exempted by any other notification or allows the interest rate supply of goods or services. So in the first slide, I discussed that uh, uh, person who uh, who may uh, who make the inter interest rate supplies is not eligible to offer the composition scheme. So if he allows any int uh, make interest rate supply, who is not allowed to make the interest rate supply? Let's take an example. 
if X has opted for the composition scheme, but he's making the interest rate supplies to the e-commerce operator. So e-commerce operator has to check whether such supplier is allowed to make the interest rate supplier through the uh, e-commerce platform. So if we allow any such person who is not eligible to make the interest rate supplies, then also he is liable under this section. And if he fails to furnish the correct details as may be required by the as may be required by the statute, then also he is liable and uh, liable under this section. So uh, what would be the penalty? Penalty would be rupees ten thousand or an amount equivalent to the tax in tax involved if the supply has made by the registered person other than the person paying tax on the section 10. That is the composite dealer. So whichever is higher, uh, that's the penalty. Either 10,000 or if same the same supply is supplied by the registered person other than the composite dealer. So uh, with this section, now e-commerce operator has a responsibility to check the supplier whether he is eligible to uh, make the supplies to the e-com platform or not. So now uh, changes in the prosecution law and uh, decriminalization on the GST. Section 138, compounding of offenses. So the minimum threshold uh, limit for prosecution under GST is raised from 1 crore to 2 crore, except for the offenses uh, involving uh, issue of invoices without actual supply of goods and services. That is a fake invoicing cases. Other than these cases, the prosecution limit has been increased from 1 crore to the 2 crore. And the compounding uh, fee also reduced. Uh, in, uh, minimum fee, uh, compounding minimum fee has reduced from 50% to 25%, whereas maximum fee has uh, reduced from 150% to the 100%. Now coming to the decriminalized activities. Section uh, 132 has provided the list of decriminalized activities. So out of this, certain uh, offenses have been removed. We'll see what are all those uh, criminal activities. So first one is uh, obstruction or preventing any officer from discharging his duties and tampering with or destruction of material evidence or document and failure to supply information required under any law or supplying false information. All these three have been removed from the serious offenses, uh, serious offenses list. That is uh, offenses which are uh, provided in the section 132. Now moving on to the section 158, is a concern based sharing information. So this is the enabling section uh, wherein GST common portal can share the information uh, with the consent of the taxpayer or the recipient. So what information the GST and GSN can share, we'll see. So what are the details, what are all the details provided in the application and the details furnished in the various returns like GSTR1, GSTR3, B, GSTR9 and details uploaded uh, in the uh, e-invoice or e-way bill or any other details as may be described. So for purpose of sharing, sharing of such details, consent uh, should mandatorily obtained from the supplier or the recipient uh, in such manner and as of now, no such manner has prescribed. So what would be the impact of this uh, new section? So now uh, post amendment, once the consent has been given by the taxpayer or the recipient, do not have any power to show the government for any liability arising out of such disclosure. So carefully have to give the consent. So, yeah, in the previous slide, also a couple of points which uh, participants I would like you to be a noteful of is uh, these are the amendments which uh, initially it was Finance Act. Now it became uh, the Finance Bill, it became a Finance Act. Okay, there is a timeline within which this gets implemented. Okay, just because the Act is there, it doesn't mean that it is implemented in the day one. You know, Section 1, Subsection 2 of the GST Act itself says that each provision will commence as and when it is notified. So every section will also be further notified. That is point number one. Point number two, you know, most of the things is linked to GSTN, right? So like uh, Jagdish was mentioning about e-commerce operator will be pay penalized if they allow other than the exempted people uh, to make a trade. 
See, firstly, currently, if you see the TCS return, GST number of the supplier is mandatory. But to provide a small, enable the small traders whose turnover is, say, up to 20 lakhs, now they're allowing them to do the supply through e-commerce within the state. Or someone who is a composition dealer, he can, he is originally prohibited to sell through e-commerce operator, can now sell through e-commerce operator, but he is, again, jurisdiction is within the state. So e-commerce operator also has to check all these things. So they are, GSTN is making a changes in the backend. And uh, I think when I read the last minutes, they have given a date, 1st October 23, they will implement. At that point, that will come into picture. Likewise, section 158A, which is exchange of the information. This one has to be very careful. Uh, though Jagdish was uh, very uh, no, uh, liberal enough in saying that uh, there is a consent that will be taken by the taxpayer, uh, the thing. But today, look at the scenario. Whenever something pops up, all that we do is you close it. Or there is a checkbox and you have to submit, you tick that and give. Kind of the consent is so motto is always uh, taken. But after inserting this provision, I think state of Punjab, Haryana, and a couple of other states have said that distinct person's turnover and their profits, I would like to see. Let's say you are here in the state of Karnataka and the tax officer is doing an assessment here. He wants to have a bird's eye view of whatever is the turnover that is there in other states, whatever the profits that are there in other states to check whether the cross charge has been done properly or not. Now, that is another area which will open Pandora box. We know Colombia, Asia, advanced ruling, where they said the turnover should also include cross charge of the employee's cost. Things like that will come up. So you also need to be careful even though GSTR 9 and 9C is self-explanatory and self-certified by the SSE, I would always recommend every taxpayer once in a while should get their books of accounts audited from the GST perspective. And if the turnover is huge, volume is huge, operations are more, you need to have a periodical review like an internal audit on GST wherein it can also be looked at what are all the likely uh, things that are getting missed. Yeah, please continue. So now this is the retrospective amendment. Uh, this is the no, uh, not the new thing, already there. <clears throat> so para, uh, as already discussed, schedule, in Schedule 3, Para 7, Para 8 has been inserted with effective from 1st February 2019. So we'll see what are all the, what is the Para 7 and what is the Para 8. Para 7, supply of goods from the place in the non-taxable territory to another place in the non-taxable territory without such goods entering into the India. That is, uh, movement will not happen. Uh, uh, goods will never uh, come to India. Uh, it will be transferred uh, outside India to another place India. Uh, and generally, this term will be called as merchant rate transactions. So, coming to the next para, para is supply of warehouse goods to any person before clearance for the home transaction. Before filing the X1 bill of entry, if any supply has happened, uh, that is the uh, para 8 here. That is the inbound sale, we, we generally uh, in court term. And coming to the 8B, supply of goods by the consignee to any other person by endorsement of documents of title to the goods, after the goods have been dispersed from the port of origin located outside India, but before clearance for the home consumption, that is, before clearance for home consumption, if any goods are sold at the high sea, uh, uh, the sea, the, uh, generally we call this as a high sea sale transaction. So, para 7 is a metal trade transaction, para 8A is the inbound sale, and para 8B is the uh, high sea sale. So all these three uh, will be the non gst supply. So what the amendment proposes, all these uh, three, para 7 and para 8, deemed to applicable from the 1st uh, July 2017, that is from the introduction, uh, from the inception of GST, all these are deemed to be applicable. So amendment clarifies that all these transactions 
would not be taxable under GST from 1 Jan 2017. So uh, this would reduce the dispute from the department for demanding taxes for the period from 1 Jan 2017 to 31 Jan 2019, where there was uncertainty on taxability of the transactions. However, uh, government has clarified that refund cannot be granted uh, if the tax has already been paid on the above transactions. So now coming to the uh, place of supply transaction, IGST, this is the amendment related to the IGST Act. So place of supply project, as per section 13, subsection 9 of the IGST Act, place of supply of services by of transportation of the goods shall be the uh, re place of registered person. If the, the same service is provided to other than the registered person, then place of supply shall be where such goods are handed over for the transportation. If goods are uh, where transportation of goods is to a place outside India, then the place of supply shall be the destination of such goods. Actually, uh, Finance Bill 2023 has proposed to omit only proviso to Section 13, Subsection N. That is uh, movement of goods to outside India. But uh, <coughs> uh, 49 GST Council meeting has recommended to omit the complete Section 13, Subsection 9. So now uh, Finance Act 2023 has omitted the Section 13, Subsection 9. Therefore, now place of supply of services of transportation of the goods would be determined as per the default rule. That is the section 13, subsection 2. As per section 13, subsection 2, place of supply would be the location of the service recipient. Okay. So it, it, this will be determined by the general rule. That is the recipient place will be the place of supply in this case. So now coming to the section 62. Currently, uh, in case of uh, this is uh, increase in the time limit for filing the return before reinitiation of best judgment assessment project. Okay, currently, if the return filed within the 30 days from the best judgment assessment order, then uh, best judgment assessment order is deemed to be withdrawn. So, the 49 uh, GST Council meeting has proposed to increase this time limit uh, for uh, 60 more days. And therefore, uh, this amendment has increased the time limit in, uh, of 60 days and further extended by 60 days, subject to payment of additional late fee of rupees 100 per day. Therefore, uh, if you file the return within one, 120 days, that is, uh, after the best judgment assessment order with the late fee, then the best judgment or assessment order uh, is deemed to be withdrawn. So, and further, it is clarified that liability to pay the interest under section 50 subsection 1 and late fee uh, under section 57 uh, for delayed filing of the returns remains applicable as it is. There is no change in section 50 subsection 1 that is interest and the late fee under section 47. So coming to the time limit for the revocation. As we all know that uh, GST law provides uh, the 30 days for filing the application for revocation of cancellation of registration. Uh, further, provision to section 30 provides the further period of 30 days uh, by the additional commissioner or the joint commissioner and further it can be extended by the furthermore 30 days by the commissioner. So net we can file the application for revocation of cancellation of registration is 90 days. So we can file the application for revocation within 90 days. So what we'll see what the amendment is. Uh, help. Now, uh, they have removed the time period of 30 days as well as provision for the extension. Further, the amendment gives reference to the CGST rules for the time period and conditions for revocation of cancellation of GST registration. They have removed the time limit in the uh, uh, Act. They have uh, moved the time, uh, given the power to the CGST rules to frame for the time period and the conditions for, to revoke. Uh, to revoke the cancellation of GST registration. Is the enabling, enabling provision. Next, coming to the, this is the main thing, main thing, uh, constitution of GST uh, appellate tribunal. Uh, so earlier, there is a lot of dispute between the center and the state in terms of 
how many members would be part of the appellate tribunal and how many benches would be there and all these things. So now uh, they have come up with, they have revised the section 109 to constitute the GST appellate tribunal as early as possible. Now, uh, as per this uh, revised this section, tribunal to be established uh, from the specified date as per the notification. So jurisdiction, power, and the authority conferred to the appellate tribunal to be accessed by both principal bench and the state bench. Principal bench consists of one president uh, who, is a, uh, uh, who is a judicial member and uh, another judicial member and one technical member, a center and, uh, and one technical member from the state. And the state bench consists of two judicial members. Out of two judicial members, senior member will be considered as a vice president. And same one technical member from center and one technical member from state. So all the matters will be heard by both the benches. So other than the uh, matters related to the place of supply, uh, place of supply matters will be uh, heard only by the principal bench only. President will have the power to distribute or transfer the business among the benches. So with regard to the number of members to be heard, uh, heard with the tax or input tax credit or fine or fee penalty involved is less than 50 lakh and with the uh, which did not uh, involve the question of law, then such matters to be heard by the single member only. In all other cases, uh, matter will be heard together by one judicial member and one technical member, any combination of between these two. So in case of any difference of opinion, uh, then the matter will be decided by the majority, including a original member who has passed the order. So if the case was only heard by the uh, member of the state bench in, ca uh, in case of difference of opinion, then such case referred to the another member of the state bench within the same state, or if no, if other member is not available, uh, then the uh, then it would be uh, referred to the member of state bench in another state. If case was really heard by the members of the principal bench, then uh, such in case of difference of opinion, uh, then such matter would be referred to the another member of the principal bench. If uh, such member is not available, then the member of another state bench, uh, they will refer. So merely because of um, defect in the constitution or vacancy uh, in the benches, the order passed by uh, such uh, authority is not invalid, invalidated. It cannot be questioned. Mere because of uh, uh, defect in the constraints of appellate tribunal. So, do you like to add anything, sir? Here? Yes. So, one point which I would like to add here is this is one important provision, and this is going to come into effect very soon because uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, upset from the uh, trade that okay five years over the tribunal is not constituted. Because the audits happen post audits, uh, the, the proper officers have issued a DRC 01 and uh, the reply was not satisfactory. The orders were passed. The orders have been already challenged with the uh, commissioner, first appellate authority. And uh, there are those orders are also have been upheld in the favor of revenue. Now, the state or of course, most of the time, state center, uh, if you choose to go for an appeal, they will wait. But the state is initiating the recovery proceedings. And there is a circular already instructions issued by the CBIC where the SSC choose to go for an appeal, you have to wait. The constitution of the benches are important for two reasons. One, the disputes would be resolved faster. Second, from the presentation in the balance sheet on the uh, the contingent liabilities, everything would also come down. And this has been something pending from long, a very welcoming news. And uh, this financial year, I will say 23-24 is more on the tribunal that is getting constituted and the matters coming up in front of them for hearing is what we will, we will now start reading more judgments. Yeah. Ashok was asking why not constituted till date. Yeah, so there uh, it has uh, multiple challenges. 
first the uh, state and center how to do it now that has all gone up and it's a constitution of uh, everything in, in the uh, under one umbrella second availability of the members both judicial and the technical members Puna was asking is there any specific date again the answer is no but most likely this year you will witness these benches uh, being operational we yes. have already formed a committee to identify the members. Sir. Yes, yes, exactly. So these benches would be operational this year. In fact, there was a celebration by this uh, stat uh, the recently there uh, in Delhi and uh, everyone very positive about uh, this stat uh, being set up and being ready. Okay, handing over to Susanna. Okay, by the way, the word MNST scheme is not a right word. Uh, it, there are some relaxation measures. Given that people are asking, okay, there has been some MNST, MNST, uh, uh, this is titled as MNST. And uh, uh, we have seen the MNST under the VAT and the various laws. Uh, the strict, strict sense, whatever the relaxing provisions which have been given, these are not to be treated as MNST scheme, but however, some relaxing provisions have been given under the GST. Yes. So, Susana. Hello. Yeah. You can Could share the screen. Okay. Can you put it into presentation now? Yes, sir. Right side. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Susanna. Today I'm going to discuss about amnesty scheme. The word is said amnesty scheme, but there is, there is no amnesty uh, as uh, said. Now, the government came up with the amnesty scheme for the taxpayers who had not filed their returns. Who had not filed their returns. First one. GSTR 4. GSTR 4 is for the composition dealers the taxpayers who had opt for the composition dealers if they have not filed their return from july 2017 to march 2020 till march 2020 then if there is no liability for that period then there will be a no no late fee if there is a liability but whatever the liability the late fee is limited to only 500 per return uh, from July 2017 to March 2019, GSTR 4 is a quarterly return. But now GSTR 4 from March 2000, uh, financial aid, uh, 20, 2019 to 20, uh, GSTR 4 is the annual return for the compensation dealers. If they have not filed their return, then the maximum uh, late fee will be only 500 per return. Here, the amnesty scheme is only for a late fee. Not a in, it is not for an interest and it is not for a liability. GSTR 9 and 9C. GSTR 9 and 9C is the annual return and reconciliation statement for all the for normal regular taxpayers. No problem. Please proceed. For. Uh, Normal uh, regular screen sharing has been stopped. One. For regular tax fees. Uh, even though your liability is if 
if the taxpayer has liability or not but there is a late fee while coming as composition dealer if there is no liability then late fee also not there but whereas coming to 9 and 9c and gst are 10 even though whatever your liability even though it's nil late fee is applicable and late fee is limited to 10000 10 10000 10, for a financial year gst are 10 gst are 10 is the final return uh, after cancellation of GST registration, within three months, the taxpayer should file GSTR 10 as a final return. If they have not fi filed the final return, then the late fee, the maximum late fee is 500 rupees. That the government has given only time uh, if they have filed return from April 2022 till June, June till June 2023, then there is a uh, late fee waiver uh, and reduction asset. If they have filed beyond june 2023 then there then the late fee whatever applicable that only will be applicable there is no amnesty scheme if return is filed after june 2023 yeah here uh, one point which i would like to highlight to everyone is uh, timelines are uh, very strictly to be adhered to the filing of the returns has to happen between April 23 to June 23, we are already on 15th April. So make sure you complete uh, previous slide, please. Go to previous slide. Uh, yeah. So make sure you file the returns between this time. Point number one. Point number two, uh, like GST or 99C, we know that the late fee is uh, up to 0.25% of the turnover in the state and 0.25% CGST, 0.25% SGST, which is pretty high. And under the GST law, the originally contemplated late fee was 100 rupees per day. Over the time, there has been relaxation. In fact, even in the COVID period, we had relaxation. Post that, it was restricted to 25 rupees, 50 rupees. So these numbers will change time to time. So you need to be very mindful of. GSTR 10 is unfortunately, whenever a return, you intend to close down your business, you make an application for surrendering. Your applications would be agreed and accepted and the communication by the mail. And within three months, you should be filing your GSTR 10 after you surrender and cancel the registration. This was not noticed and paid by many. Unfortunately, there was a late fee of 10,000 rupees and uh, where someone did not want to uh, continue the business, they had to still pay this. This was no choice. Even that was waived off. The respective notifications were there on the notification set. The only urge here is pending returns. Please file within June 23. Preeti, the next slide. Yeah, Triti, you have to unmute yourself. Hello, good afternoon everyone, I am Preeti. Now we will discuss about revocation of cancellation of registration. If your GST registration has been cancelled, you can make an application for revocation of cancellation of registration within the time limit as Jagadish Sir said. You can make an application for revocation in form GST or is it 21? Where the registration is cancelled, we can revoke within 30th June 2023. For this, the following two conditions is satisfied. First, we should file all the returns which were due, which were not filed, and we should pay the taxes along with interest, penalty, and late fee. 
non filer yeah. proceedings and yeah, this before we move to non filer uh, this is also one welcoming uh, provision uh, so that is why i said it is strictly not an amnesty uh, there are certain relaxations that have come so if someone has cancelled the registration when we say cancelled could have been uh, uh, happened accidentally meaning i made a submission for cancellation please note GSTR 10 is not filed, like we have not closed it. Our department would have cancelled since you have not been filing the returns. They have suspended your account. Now, earlier, we, we had a provision that within 60 days, we have to go back to the officer and seek a request. Now, the power was not there to the officer if you go late. This was causing an issue people had to end up uh, taking an additional registration and the old registration last returns to be filed all those issues were coming up so one time relaxation has been given relaxation of what saying that i can submit a revoke button saying that no i don't want to cancel my registration i want to continue the business so please revoke my cancellation application restore my registration However, this action has to be done on or before 30th June. To do this, assuming your, your cancellation happened, let's say, in September 22. September 22, the cancellation has happened. You go, before you hit the revoke button, whatever the pending returns which needs to be filed, you have to file. Only then the revoke buttons will be activated. After it is activated within 30 days, you also have to regularize the return. You will have to pay the taxes, interest, penalty, if any, late fees, which is applicable accordingly, has to be filed. Only then the officer will put the status back. Even if you file nil return, but you file the returns, making sure the registration becomes active and restored. The next one. Next, non filer proceedings under section 62. Section 62 is of assessment of non filers of return. It deals with where a registered person fails to furnish the returns even after service of a notice. Under this section, also, we can restore our GST registration on or before 8th June 2023. For this, also, the following two conditions need to be satisfied. As I said previously, we should file all the pending returns and we should pay the taxes along with interest, penalty, and late fees. Yeah. So there was one another uh, issue which uh, where assessment of non-filers is done. You know, if the an SSC is not filing any return, now state wants to collect their taxes. So the power has been given to the officers to do a best judgment assessment. Now they would be calling as a best judgment, but it could be a worst judgment. And if a judgment is made then you have no choice you have to be abiding by it and the officer when he is doing an assessment uh, he thinks that uh, uh, month over month uh, your business is growing at 14 percent and all those things he will come with a fancy turnover number and apply 18 percent and provide a levy on it your first job whenever a best judgment assessment happened under section 62 is to furnish a valid return within 30 days from the date you received the assessment order. Otherwise, it will be deemed that what you have, what the assessment order is saying is the right return. Assuming assessment order is saying 10 lakhs, you are filing a return saying that my turnover is 1 lakh and 18,000 rupees only liability and not 10 lakhs. The moment you file the return, the order shall be deemed withdrawn. Right, the order shall be deemed with the run. For that 18,000, you will end up paying interest and late fee. But please make sure within 30 days the return is filed. Yes, please continue. Next slide. So uh, with this, there is other few more uh, recent changes or recent update has come. One of which is about registration. 
now they have said that biometric based registration will be there under gst like for G, for aadhaar we were going to the banks uh, some uh, common sectors post office department and all for our biometric uh, update similar pattern they are going to launch for the gst also as of now same has been done only for the state of gujarat and other state have been exempted from it but with the success of gujarat there is a chances not there is a chances they are going to implement it for all other state also another important change or update which they have done is about extension of time limit for issuance of order under section 73 now what is 73 73 prescribe for the issuance of notice and order in case of non fraud cases so as we know every proceeding under gst is time bound for everything they have given a time limit under which a uh, as an officer has to do his work similarly being an ssc we have to also comply within that time limit section 73 which deals with the non fraud cases it's provide for issuance of order in such cases to be 3 year from the due date of annual return now if you will see the financial year 1718 gstr 99c that due date was is 5th or 7th feb based on the states 2020 so 7 feb 2020 accordingly the last date for issuance of order become 3 years from that that is 7th or 5th feb 2023 now they have extended it till 31st december 23 if you remember in between also past 3 4 month back also they have come with one notification they are also they extended it That this timeline to September. Now they have extended to to December twenty three. So even now, seventeen eighteen is not out of the question. Officer has power to issue the notices under this section for the purpose of alleging the demand and making the recovery. So timeline has not only been increased for seventeen eighteen. It has also it has been increased for all the three years. Seventeen eighteen they increased to thirty first December twenty twenty three. Financial year eighteen ninety March twenty four and nineteen twenty June twenty four, thereby providing an extended time to the officer to do their inquiry or investigation proceeding. It's a very important because one of the check when we receive the notice is we check whether it is within the time limit because if it is not within the time limit, sometimes even though the notice issued on merit. you don't have any ground to defend but this come as handy whereby on account of time barred cases are there where full demand has been dropped or set aside another important change that they brought out is about late fee but this late fee update they have brought only for 99c they have provide a reduced late fee amount so if you are having a turnover up to 5 crore for turnover up to 5 crore you need to only file gstr 9 so they have prescribed rupees 50 per day marks to 0.4% of the turnover earlier the late fee for gstr 9 was 100 200 rupees per day igs uh, cgst plus s i am saying 200 per day and it was 0.5% of the turnover now which has been reduced to 50 per day And zero point zero four percent for turnover up to five crore, and for the turnover between five crore up to twenty crore, uh, this has become hundred per day up to max of point zero four percent of turnover. For above twenty crore, it is the same which is prescribed under the law. That is two hundred per day max to zero point five percent of the turnover. Now, if you will notice. Jagdish has discussed in the uh, not Jagdish while Preeti and Susanna were discussing, they were talking you about the amnesty scheme, which sir itself said that it's not an amnesty scheme. So they have provided an opportunity to the SSC to file their GSTR nine and nine C, and it's a very good opportunity because prior to this period they prescribe prior to this benefit they have floated out. There are number of cases where notices has been issued for non-filing. and a very good amount of late fee have been paid 
Now the question arises: the late fee which already be paid, there is no provision they have prescribed for refund. However, you can take up your chances because it will be against the principle of natural justice because it's not a equality in law because person who have complied, though complied delay, you are asking them to pay the late fee as prescribed under law, which is 200 per day. And now who haven't prescribed, you have come with the option to them to file between this period and you are liable to pay only 10,000. So it's a good opportunity. Utilize this opportunity. If you have not filed your 99C, check, go on your portal. If it is applicable, do it now so that you can take the benefit of those. With this, we come to the end of our update which has come through Finance Act or through the notification issued during this month. So let us move to what you need to do for financial year 22-23, which has ended, but for the purpose of GST to make sure you haven't missed out any liability or your ITC claim, we will be now discussing for the same. Now, first starting with the outward part. So what you should do at your outward part to check whether everything, whatever you have filed in your GST return is in accordance with law and there is no tax applicability or short payment of tax. So what should be the first? The first what you should do is you should make sure whatever your outward turnover you have shown in your books is matched with your R1 and 3B. See, R1 is for the purpose of disclosure of the invoices, transaction which you have done as B2B or B2C. It may be also based on type of export, uh, type of supply like export or uh, export with pay, without pay, SEZ supply, non-GST supply. So when you are doing your repo, you should do in a multi-dimensional way. You should not just match that turnover if it's in books is 100 rupees, whether your R1 is showing 100 and your 3B, the tax discharge on under 3B is showing on 100 rupees or not. You should all check the rate, whether the rate which you have mentioned for your goods or service you have provided, is it correct or not? Whether the declaration which you are ma making about the type of supply, like whether it's a B2B, B2C, because this all have implication. Your wrong declaration result into not only the problem for you, but also the person whom, whom you are dealing. If you disclose B2B trans, B2 transaction as B2C, there is a high cost of chances that your uh, corresponding as, uh, recipient will lose the ITC due to non-disclosure of same as to B2B and the same not reflecting in GSTR 2B. As we all know, as of now, that there is no concept of that provisional cap, which they have come up with 20%, 10%, 5%. Now, what is shown in 2B, that is the OT only ITC available to the SSC. So you must make sure that rate-wise, type-wise, even people do mistake in type-wise also, it is export with pay, they select export without pay. That also have issue because at the time of filing refund claim, you will come to know the department try to disallow you the refund on ground of this wrong disclosure. So now you have the time, you do your full year repo, you check anything missed out or any changes need to be done because amendment time is also there. As through our last to last to last through section, we have discussed that amendment time for GSTR 1 for the purpose of disclosure has been increased till 30th November. So you have a time till now also check Rico if anything to be added, any bill need to be amended that is done or not. Credit note, if any supply you are expecting that there will be no amount is going to receive then you should raise your credit note so that at least tax loss you can save. But it may be noted, credit note is not allowed for the purpose of bad debt. It is allowed only in three circumstances. That is when there is a deficiency of goods or services or when there is a return of goods or services. So in those circumstances only you are allowed to raise credit note. However, people raise in case of debit note, non-realization of payment, or if there is a return of goods also, goods or service, then also you can raise. So you need to be very much careful while raising credit note, what your credit note description is saying. 
because it's outside the section 36, then department may disallow you the benefit of tax you have taken under the credit note. Okay. Another uh, yeah, continue advance. Continue, continue. Uh, advance. So as we know, on advance of goods, there is no tax to be payable, but advance on services, GST need to be paid. But we are still finding many of the SSE are not paying GST as and when advances are received. See, at the end, we know that against those advances, we are going to bill and accordingly tax would be discharged. But what will be in the question is due to this timing difference, Department will ask you to pay the interest. If you are in such type of business where the mechanism is in such a way that receipt of advances are quite high, it's better you discharge because on that amount, interest amount will be very high. So you need to be very much careful on that aspect. Then if there is a sale of asset, even today, though it's been six years, but people are still confused on what asset and how it's to be paid. We need to be very much careful when we say sale of asset, okay, GST need to be paid. But in sale of asset, there is a two thing. One, where there is a sale of asset where you have availed ITC. And another is sale of asset where you haven't availed the ITC. Then that is further divided into sale of motor vehicle and sale other than motor vehicle. Because for sale of motor vehicle, they have specifically given the provision on how to calculate the tax on the same. So if there is a sale of motor vehicle, then they are saying you have to sales price minus depreciable amount as per Income Tax Act, not as per Companies Act. That is the margin on which you have to pay GST. And for others, it is directly on the value you have charged to your recipient. On that, you have to directly discharge the tax. But if it comes with ITC, there is a different mechanism. Now they are saying it will be higher of the two, either tax on transaction value or ITC, which need to be reversed on account of sale before five years. For utilization of ITC on asset, they have given a bracket of five years. So if there is an asset on which you have availed the ITC, and if you sell before five years, then you have to keep in mind that it will be higher of tax on transaction value or ITC that is left to be means after the sale, if some years which is left between the five years, that need to be reversed. Whichever is higher, you are required to do that. So it's most of the people, they normally pay on sale. They don't have this marginal because if you apply this, it's a cost effective. Somehow it helps you to reduce your tax liability if this mechanism is followed. So that need to be checked. Another disputed one is recoveries. Recovery is the most disputed and with the circular 178, which described about various recovery, various liquidated damages, when, as and when taxes to be paid. Because recoveries may be in the nature of supply and may not be. It depends. It, there cannot be a straight way jacket that some money is right. You pay the tax. That cannot be applied. Everything need to be a thing from the point of view of the supply. That, that is first, it should fall under section seven. If doesn't fall under section, whatever, even the money you have relied, there is a flow of money that doesn't mean taxes payable. So you have to see whether your recovery fall into or not. The disputed recoveries like notice pay recovery. In circular 178, they have clarified that this type of recovery are not in the nature of supply and there should be no tax payable on the same. Sir. Yeah. So, uh, friends, one thing which I would like to mention here is uh, GSTR1 should be a replica of what is the turnover for the year. See, 3B is a tax discharging document. Maybe you would have paid extra, maybe you have paid short, which you have discharged, let's say, in the March, you, by mistake, you press that nil button and you paid in April. That is no worry. But when it comes to GSTR 1, it has to be the turnover for the period. 
So if I want to assess what is your turnover year on year, I will pick your GSTR one, that is my turnover. Given that you have filed your March return on 11th April, now you have 12 months GSTR one with you. Consolidate that, including advances adjusted, consolidate that. You will arrive at a number that will be showing. This is the number that should be shown in the books of accounts. Your books of accounts and this should match. Assuming it is not matching, can I correct it? Yes, you can correct it. In April, you can correct it. Yes, you can correct it in April. You have the table 10 and the table 9 where you can make the respective amendments for B2C for 10 and B2B debit notes, credit notes in your 9. You can make those respective amendments, but you got to amend in the respective period. Say March GSTR 1 was erroneously filed with my GST number instead of, say, Ashika's GST number. In April, you correct that. Or let's say you have reported everything as B2C. In April, you reduce the B2C turnover and report actual B2B turnover. The requirement is your Sigma 12 GSTR ones should match. And I also want to draw attention of viewers, section 75, subsection 12, where in fact, uh, the Finance Act 21 has made a small amendment, inserted an explanation saying that if the self-assessed tax is not paid, the recovery under 79 will be initiated. What is self-assessed tax? Whatever you are reporting in GSTR 1 as your turnover and liability, it yeah. will be deemed that you have assessed that your, as your tax. Mm -hmm. That will be your self-assessed tax. Mm -hmm. The explanation to 75 subsection 12, which has been inserted in the Finance Act 21, wide notification 39, it has been made active. So you got to be paying attention to GSTR 1. That is what Ashika has brought all the information that has to be brought into GSTR 1, please look. Now, 12 months R1 you have filed. Books of accounts are ready. Make sure you do it. In fact, the e-invoice timelines also are coming down. Earlier, if assuming someone has turnover across 10 crores but forgot to do e-invoice last year, I'll say it's okay, you do e-invoice. But now with the latest uh, the uh, uh, advisory given by the GSTN, they will only be giving seven days to upload the previous dated uh, transactions. Right now, they're doing for 100 crores, but overly everything will, will boil down. So better a lost opportunity to correct your GSTR one. Go ahead. And it is also advisable for amendment and correction. If you want to do, do it within the year. The reason being, if you will see on your portal, if you go view notices, then you will see the number of reasons for differences of the notice which you get for the scrutiny under section 61 is due to the fact because some amendment which though relates to 22-23 given in 23-24, those amendments are not auto populated in their data as a result of which when they issue you the notice, they take the original data which you have given, not the amended. So it's better if you do the amendment within the year so that the difference between 1 and 3B, if any, due to any error, will be verified, will be corrected, and they will find that net of there is zero liability. Now, if you are a SSC who is having a multiple registration, in case of multiple registration, you need to be more precaution because there are multiple related party transactions there might be due to which multiple implication will come. One of is like input service distributor registration or a cross charge. Both are interchangeably used. Means it depends upon you whether you want to use go for ISD or cross charge. Now, what is ISD or cross charge? Basically, where there is a head office, head office incurs some expenses which are common in nature, or it may be also exclusively incurred for some br other branches. Now, which are common expenses? The GST says if if you go to schedule one, 
if it is a transaction between related party, even there is no flow of money, it is not considered that they have straight away said it will be considered as supply and you will be liable to pay tax. So it's upon you. What you can do is if you offer ISD, then the expenses incurred by head office, which is commonly for other branches, or it may relate to two or three branches, then it is advisable for head office, take ISD registration instead of claiming yourself, distribute it to your branches, one. Or if that is also not workable, the amount which is charged to you, you charge it to your branches. In that way, you will get the credit of the bills which you have received from your vendor and simultaneously that tax liability will be discharged by way of that credit and this credit will be automatically passed on to your branches. So either of the two you can use for stock transfer. Like I said, even though there is no supply between branches to branches, but GST recognize it. So if there is any chance, one stock transfer from one branch to another that will be considered as supply and you have to pay tax on it. Valuation aspect is very important in this. Now, if you will see, you will say, I'm not getting anything. See, even though if I build to another of my branches, I will be billing what I have incurred. So over here, there is one important thing to be kept in mind that the rule uh, 28, which deals with the valuation of related party, it says that it does not matter to me what you build between your related party until and unless your related party or your recipient at the end is getting 100% ITC. It does not matter even if you charge one rupee. However, if 100% ITC is not available, then you need to be very much careful on what you are billing because there may be a case where your branches may be incurred or head office may be in the exam plus taxable supply. At that time, you need to be very much careful while doing your GST reconciliation and GST tax discharge. TDS and TCS. If any of the clients has TDS and TCS credit, check in your books how much is the amount you are showing to be receivable. Then check with the GST portal. In GST portal, if we will go, if we have a TCS, uh, we have, there may be payable, there might be receivable also. So if you have, you check with the electronic credit, uh, cash ledger also, whether it is properly done or not, or GST I filed for the same or not. IDC 04, goods movement for to and from job worker. If there is any manufacturer, principal manufacturer, who is sending their goods for the purpose of job work, then you need to be careful that in case of input one year and capital goods three year, you must receive the goods for which you have given for job work. If you don't receive, then it will be considered as a supply. If you have received, then there is no liability. Plus you have to make sure you file ITC 04. ITC 04 is if you have a turnover up to five crore, then you have been given an option to file yearly at the end of the year by 30th April, 25th April. Or if you are above 5 crore, then you have to file half yearly. By the every six months, you have to make sure you file it off. Another is export compliances. See, when we are doing export of goods, the for export of goods, the only condition is goods should move outside India. So if goods move outside India, export compliance is done and chapter is closed. But when we come to export of service, as this is an intangible, it cannot be seen. The thing is that how they track there is export of service happen or not is where is the provider of service, where is the recipient of the service, whether amount is received in Forex or not. So you have to make sure you receive the payment. They have given a time limit to receive the payment. So if you receive the payment, Within the one year, then there is no issue. If you are not receiving the sub payment within one year, then it will not be regarded as export of service and you have to pay tax on the same. Another concept is merchant exporter. Whenever and goods is procured for the purpose of export, this benefit has been given. Now the person who has intended to export goods outside India, but he routed through another export. 
So in that case, they have said that I will give you a benefit of 0.1%. Means they are saying the person who is interested to get good exported, he need to charge 0.1% on the value of the goods irrespective of fact what the rate of tax applicable but this benefit is available subject to certain conditions that there should be an intimation to the assistant officer jurisdictional assistant officer that there is such procurement at the rate of zero percent zero point one percent further shipping will also declare that there, this goods has been procured against this invoice which have been purchased at the rate of zero point one percent so this all condition need to be fulfilled in order to get this benefit of merchant export. Now, if you are making a supply to SEZ, so for the purpose of SEZ supply, you need an SEZ officer endorsement or a DTA procurement form. Then only it will be regarded as supply made to SEZ. Otherwise, it will become taxable. Means not taxable will be the right word, but obviously litigation will be there. Uh, before we move further, there's one question from Vadivel who is asking about ITC 04. Who has to file ITC 04? Yeah. So this is uh, one uh, document which generally not much complied well. ITC 04 is basically a declaration which is furnished by principal who is a registered principal which shows the details of inputs and the capital goods which have been dispatched to a job worker and whatever which has been received because we know within one year the inputs have to come back and within three years the capital goods have to come back so they have given a relaxation turnover up to five crores file it yearly turnover beyond five crores file every six months Advantage of filing ITC 04. Someone is coming for inspection to your premises. Goods are not there. They will say that, okay, you made a sales, it has been suppressed. You can say, no, these goods have already been sent for job work. What is the proof? In the month of January, you have sent the goods for job work. Where is the proof that it has been sent? Your ITC 04 would say that, yes, this has been sent to the job work and this much quantity. Earlier, it used to be filed on a quarterly basis, but now it is uh, half yearly and yearly basis. The 25th of the, uh, the, the subsequent period ending, one has to file the return. Hope this answers the question very well. This would include goods moving out and goods coming back. And there's one other question from Bhuvana is merchant export. Ashika, can you just explain merchant export once again? So in merchant expo, like there are multiple persons are there. They are a small person. So in, but they want their good to be exported outside India. So what they do, they have, they get in touch with the person who are in the export business. So they give their goods to them and who export it to them. But it's not that every time it's work in this fashion, sometime exporter person, when he is purchasing from the market for the purpose of goods, for the purpose of export, then this benefit has been given that such procurement of goods, which is done for the purpose of exporting, he can do such procurement at a reduced rate of 0.1%. So when he is procuring the goods, suppose on which 18% GST rate is applicable, instead of that, the person from whom he is procuring in that invoice, he will quote about this notification, write the rate at the rate of 0.1% and bill it on the exporter who on after procurement of goods, then it will export it outside the India. Then he is doing. Yeah, just to put it in a simple terms, we have this concept of penultimate sales under the uh, CST. As well, law. See here, uh, Gashika rightly mentioned not everyone who is exporting, he is the manufacturer of the goods. In case of a merchant exporter, you can consider him as a trader of the goods. 
he procures all the goods domestically because not necessarily every manufacturer who in India has an ability to export because having the export related obligations being fulfilled, understanding the international market, the market needs a quality and a quantity, ability to supply, ability to take that risk of all those things. Here is a merchant exporter who comes and says, hey, look, I'll take care of that risk, procure all the goods and now sending it. There are some conditions, okay? So given that he is a trader, he is not a manufacturer, so they have given a relaxation saying that the person who is selling to the merchant exporters can sell at 0.1%. Please note deemed export and this is a little different. Uh, people always get confused with this. The condition for the merchant exporter he is he should uh, procure the goods and within 90 days he should be uh, exporting the goods outside India. And this is the guy who should have already registered with the Export Promotion Council or there is a commodity board, if he has to be uh, registered with them, okay? And uh, there is a process uh, where, while he uh, making a 0.1%, uh, he will have to uh, make sure necessary forms are declared, submitted to the his vendor suppliers, yeah? That's little about merchant export. Go ahead. Now, coming at the input side. Now the input, side as the uh, input side you need to make sure that the ITC on which you are availing ITC the first thing it should be eligible the first test you need to do eligibility now for eligibility section 16 and 17 come into picture now section 16 says you should be in possession of the goods or service invoice or you should must have received the goods and service you should have made payment to your vendor. You should have filed the return and the transaction should be reflecting in JSTR 2B. If all these conditions are satisfied, then only you are eligible to claim ITC. Now, the another thing which come into this is a block credit under Section 17.5. So, Section 17.5 specifies some certain specific goods or services on which no ITC will be eligible like rent at cap, I'm saying about the common one, which more or less uh, it's appearing in the balance sheet. It's like motor vehicle. If there is any trans any expenses in relation to motor vehicle, basically passenger transport service, passenger transport, which is capacity below 13%, then your uh, life insurance, mediclaim insurance of the employee, rent at cap, food and beverage, then one important thing is also in there is about good law, stolen, destroy, return on. So any you know, material which is lost during the process of manufacturing doesn't come over here. The which the goods which get lost or stolen, and then only you are required to reverse ITC on it. Uh, then you have to make sure while doing your reco will to be that all your I transaction are reflecting. If it is not reflecting, now it's your time to follow up with your vendor. If it is not added, ask them to do and include their in B2B transaction. If suppose it is added with, with an error, you can follow up with them to make sure that it is amended. Similar way, it may also be a case you may not have entered in the books, though reflecting in 2B. Just check whether those transactions belong to you or not. Because sometimes due to wrong GST quotation, it GST registration mentioning it happened that it's by mistake reflecting in your 2B. So just check if it does belong to you or not. If it's belong to you, then only account for. In this, you need to be very much careful if any SSE while filing their GSTR one, if he has click on reverse charge, yes, though he has charged you the tax then you have to ask your SSC to make the changes. You can't leave it that it is reflecting, okay, no problem, one silly mistake, reverse charge, yes. Because of this also, you will suffer a notice. And as the notice start, a cost is attached to it. Though at a later stage, you will win. You will be able to prove that if it's under forward charge, you paid the tax, it's just a clerical mistake. But which you can avoid now, why you need to go into the litigation and get the cost because sometimes it's happened the amount involvement is so small that we think of let's pay it off and close 
once we pay it off and close now it's not ended for this year for every subsequent year they start opening those files so you need to be very much careful even any error you are seeing in gstr 2b make sure that is also corrected and as we discussed in the outward about the cross charge stock transfer and input service distribution so that also you need to be checked even though cross charge is there it doesn't mean every itc will be eligible you have to check you should not be covered under block credit documentation compliance is very much must because sometime what happened while filing isd return if there is error in that distribution even though you have a proper documentation and it is not properly uh, properly reflecting in 2b will also be a cause of litigation so you make sure that everything your document your books and the data reflecting in gst portal all are matching it with each other and are in reconciliation with each other now if you have not made the payment within 180 days to your supplier then you have to reverse the itc if you will remember prior to this discussion when jagdish was discussing about finance act um, finance act changes one of the topic he took is payment made within 180 days over there he said that that there is one change which has been brought out a change has been brought out is earlier it was written that if any payment has not been made within 180 days itc need to be reversed the problem was it was not written as itc need to be reversed it was said to be that amount needed to add to output tax liability now output tax liability we give in table 3 1a where we say what is my outward tax payable if you will write over there the itc which is reversible on account of this obviously my value and my the tax taxable amount with taxable amount and tax amount which i am showing over there on back calculation will not match so this was a lacuna in the act though everybody was reversing itc only nobody was adding to output tax liability but to curb to remove that lacuna in the law what they did they clarify you need to reverse itc so you have to make sure if any payment is not made reverse that itc and once the payment is made then you are duly eligible with this they have also brought out one more change is about proportionate payment concept because sometime it was happening that people may not be paying full amount maybe due to some dispute happening between party part amount they were paying so now they have said on the basis of part amount which has been paid you will be eligible for the itc obviously balance you will claim as and when you pay but how this work is first you have to claim and once the payment is not made then only you have to reverse if you didn't claim and you think that you will claim when the payment is made then there will be a problem reason being for claiming an itc there is a time limit 164 which as of now is 30th november so itc of 22 23 you need to avail before 30th november 23 if you don't avail then you are not eligible because somehow you will say i am availing and i am reversing at the end it is nullified only when i am paying it uh, i am eligible for it so as as you are paying you are eligible time limit is not applicable but the problem is this gstr 3b is now linked to 2b so even though payment is not made within 180 days it will be forming part of your 2b and accordingly in auto populated data it will be showing in your 3b so it's better you avail and reverse because if you don't avail if you want to take this ground that payment is not made within 180 days officers will not allow it then as we discuss about the taxability in case of sale of assets so i said where you have claim itc it will be higher of trans tax on transaction value or itc which need to be reverse so if any sale of asset is there then you need to be careful on which you are liable accordingly it may be reversal it may be a tax payment rule 42 and 43 it deals with case of where the scc is engaged in both type of supply what both type of supply exempt and taxable supply in that case you need to follow this rule 
and it say that common input service like security service like your office related expenses these are common services which we can't dis distinguish how much relate to exempt and taxable so based on turnover they said you have to calculate and proportionately reversed then good laws and stolen already discussed another is it is specifically for construction service provider so anybody is in construction line in case of residential property is obviously no itc is allowed but in case of commercial or in case of rrep up to the extent of commercial itc is allowed but when we receive oc certificate after receipt of ot certificate sale made after that no gst is applicable so what the uh, rule says rule says if you i have received oc then for that period from the construction when it started till the end uh, you have to do your ietc reversal based on sale on which you haven't paid tax on account of been sale of immobile property and on which you have paid the tax you will be eligible for itc of the sale now this week uh, with this we come to reverse charge mechanism for rcm obviously you have to check each and every expense you have booked in your book go through every expense even on which gst has been charged you need to be careful maybe your supplier by mistake have charged under forward charge but it's related to rcm it is advisable ask your supplier to make the changes ask him to show it under rcm don't pay to the supplier even though it's a revenue neutral case at the first instance you won't be able to save it you have to go into litigation in order to protect it so check your expenses thoroughly whether any expense fall under rcm or not if it fall discharge the tax plus if your supplier are registered who are providing rcm then also who are providing under rcm then also same will be reflecting in 2b so any transaction which is reflecting in 2b as rcm yes check whether liability is there or not if you are saying liability is not there you should know why it is not there because for department the gstr1 and 2b what has been auto populated is their master data and on that basis they are proceeding against the ssc then you have to check now the thing is that tax paid is not equivalent to itc available under rcm that need to be understood you may be thinking i am paying tax under rcm i should be eligible for 100% itc on the same that's not the case like if we say about rent a cab on renting of motor vehicle you are liable to pay under rcm but it is specifically covered under block credit though you paid under tax under rcm but no itc is eligible then it's a real estate sector another is a construction service provider they have to make sure they avail 80% of their input input service from registered if they don't avail then they have to pay under rcm one of the another compliance of rcm where most of the people are lacking is raising of sales invoice because for rcm if you have received from it is only sales invoice need to be raised only when you receive from unregistered person so if you receive from unregistered person you should raise a sales invoice declaring the type of expenses with the invoices detail if possible that on this this invoices you are discharging under rcm this is the list of the services which are covered under rcm highlighted ones are little common which more or less uh, any of business might be happening uh, i think we are unable to hear you but uh, nevertheless like uh, transport linked to the service. new one yeah uh, so whatever the thing which you are which is appearing on the screen are the gamut of entries that are on rcm uh, for the ease of everyone ashika has highlighted certain things in the blue color which most likely everyone will be uh, you know applicable for okay and the last one which is in bold this is a new one that has come rcm on rent now any business entity 
let's check my firm when and when I has taken a premises on rent. The owner of the building, the landlord is unregistered person. So when an unregistered person is supplying a dwelling to a registered person, such registered person has to pay GST under reverse charge. This got introduced effective June last year. So you got you better cross-check financially at 22-23 if there is any rent expenditure that is booked and there is no GST paid on it or charged by the supplier, which is the landlord, you better pay it under reverse charge. In fact, someone was asked, okay, what happens if I miss it? Assuming 21-22, I miss it, can I pay now? You have to pay. There is no option like, can I? You have to pay. Will the ITC restriction be there? In my view, yes, ITC would be restricted. You will not be eligible to take ITC. 16-4 is the bus for the ITC timeline. And the 30th November of 22 is the due date to claim any missed out to credits that is including RCM. Yes, Ashika. <laughs> And uh, these are the RCM on goods. Now, another important thing is closure of entry for financial year 22 23. So, Yeah, so you also need to find a way you reconcile your books of accounts with the electronic credit ledger entries. See, what you have to do is create an intermediary ledger, electronic cash ledger, electronic credit ledger, electronic liability ledger. Whenever you make a purchase of goods, you debit the expenditure, debit CGST, SGST and credit the vendor. Contrarily, when you make a sale, you debit the customer, credit revenue, credit CGST, SGST liability. For the ease of understanding, let's say when I purchase, I debit it to CGST input. When I make a sale, I credit it to CGST output. Upon filing of my GST R1 and 3B, I need to travel these balances in these ledgers to electronic liability and credit ledger. That way, you are making sure your books of accounts are matching with the government portal. Let's say my input tax credit, I will debit electronic credit ledger, basis the values which is there in say 4A of GST or 3B and credit my CGST input, SGST input and IGST input. Upon this, I'm actually making sure my input ledgers are becoming zero. I am not using the balance in this input ledger, but I'm using the balance that I've reported in 3B. Say 20th April, I'm filing the 3B of the March. Basis my 20th April, I will post an entry in the books of accounts backdated 31st March, debiting electronic credit ledger, crediting CGST, SGST, IGST input. After this entry, if there is any balance that is left in those ledgers, that means you have, assuming if there is a debit balance, you have a short reporting of input tax credit. You have purchased high, but reported low. What does this mean? There are some suppliers who, who are appearing, not appearing in 2B. So they have not filed their GSTR1 in time or filed it late or not at all filed. It could be any of the scenarios. So these reconciliation ledgers will help you. So you can park the mismatched entries, which is by 2A separately. This is what you have to post a GST ledger closing entries month over month, which will help you to reconcile, be, give you a bigger picture. If at all you have to report anything in table 10, 11, 12, 13 of GST or 9, these ledgers will be of use to you. Yes, Ashish. Then uh, moving forward to 23-24, you have to make sure you have comply with all this thing. Is first, if your turnover, like sir already said for e-invoicing, if your turnover of any of the preceding year has exceeded 10 crore, then make sure you have, uh, comply with it from April 23. 
if you are into export and you are going to do it without payment of tax, then you can file your LUT in order to be eligible. Though it's considered as a procedural lapse, but when the department issue notices, they don't consider at a first level stage. If you are a good transport agency or a good transport operator engaged in transportation service, then they are required to file an extra five if you are opting for forward charge. GST rates, two rates they have prescribed, five or 12, five without ITC, 12 with ITC. So a person engaged in transport willing to offer forward charge, they should file this an extra five for the financial year 23-24. And if your turnover is less than five crore, you have an option to offer QRMP scheme. IETC 04, as we already discussed, if up to 5 crore, you have to file yearly and above 5 crore, half yearly. So if any of you are principal manufacturer who are required to file it, get the data ready, file it off. As of now, there is no late fee they have prescribed. So any pending period also you can file. GSTR 4, composition, annual return for composition, the date is 31st April. So you need to file for it. Aadhaar authentication, if it's pending, get it done. Check your GST registration because most of the time people after doing migration or taking registration 2017-18, they didn't went and check if any changes need to be done or not. Either it may be in relation to director amendment, it may be a place of business, additional place of business addition. Any small changes which is required, go check and do that. Because sometimes it is happening, even though you might have applied properly, but your RC copy is also not getting updated. Or if it is there, it is showing you both the picture of director same or both the picture of director details same. So go download your RC copy. If there is any error, make a change, make an amendment and apply for it. Then as we discussed, for GSTR 1 and 3B amendment, you have a time limit to do by 30th November 2023. So check your recourse. If any error or mistake has happened in 22-23, you can take care now in 23-24. In addition to that, what we discuss at the time of Finance Act, changes with we have brought in, Act has brought in, that you need to be very much careful, like CSR. Like Sir said, that ITC on CSR expenditure, what we should do if that has been incurred by a non-body corporate what will happen to ITC, which is before this clause coming into picture. So in my opinion, I feel that even if this has come now, it should not impact my earlier period ITC one. And as it is specifically set for expenditure, which is incurred under section 135. So those who are not covered under that, then ITC should be allowed. But is a open to litigation. The CSR is one of the important thing you need to be careful. Then your uh, exam supply, like sub 8A, which has been given retrospective uh, effect, that is supply from where, supply to warehouse before home clearance. Though it has been exempted, but with that exemption, they have also covered it under the head exempt value. Schedule 3 of the supply, which deals with activity, which is neither a supply of goods or service. All those activities are non-GST. They does not qualify as exempt supply for the purpose of ITC reversal of Rule 42 or 43. It is only those which have been specifically mentioned in Section 17.3 that only qualify. And how in that, one of which is your Para 5 which has already he has discussed of sale of apartment after OC and sale of land or sale of building. Then your 8A, which is supply to warehouse before home consumption. All this you need to take care by moving forward. So with this, we come to the end of our session, GST session. Sir, over to you. Or anybody have any question on GST? Uh, there is one question. Sangram was asking: Is there any change in the invoice limit from ten crores to five crores? As of now, no. It is still ten crores. 
hoping for awaiting for the uh, latest notification. So 10 crores in the any of the previous financial. So 21, 22 or 22, 23, if your turnover exceeded 10 crores, from 1st April, you have to do the e invoice. And uh, with regards to the input tax credit of um, CSR related thing, uh, my colleague Ashika has answered, yes, it is eligible to take the credit, okay? By the way, uh, in our office, we have a policy, we agree to disagree each other. So I wouldn't agree with that answer. And that is where she has politely put a disclaimer that this is open for litigation. And I would put it this way. She has a view as yes. I have a view as a no, which means department is likely to litigate this. 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, it has happened. It has completed. If you have taken the credit, you can fight for it. You have a chance to fight for it. Don't worry, Ashika will protect you. She does a very beautiful drafting of uh, replies uh, and representation to the department. So the plain answer to it, it could be yes or a no. It is subject to litigative. That is the word I like from Ashika, saying that it is not a clear yes or a no. Going forward, it is very clear that it is yes. Two reasons she has also mentioned this has been introduced in this in this act. Now, you may say earlier these litigations were not there owing to advance rulings, the clarification was required. When this was introduced, like there was, when there was a change in the schedule to related aspect or many changes that came in, some changes came with retrospective effect, including transactions relating activities, transaction relating to clubs and association. It was made as a retrospective effect. However, this amendment is not retrospective, it is prospective. Yeah, Hence, yeah. one can take a view that yeah. this has come now, the credit would be available for the past periods. Yeah. So with this, we come to the end of this session one, we move to the session two. Any questions uh, to anyone? And here is our email ID. Uh, feel free to be in touch with us for any other aspects that you need to discuss. All right. So let me share Far BI. By the way, parallelly, this session would be taken by my colleague Tarun. Is Tarun there? Yes, Tarun. So uh, you can unmute yourself and you can put on your video. Uh, Stephen requests you to make Tarun as co-host. Friends, let's move on to the second technical subject of today, which is on the technology automation. Today, we will give you a glimpse of introduce the Power BI. So as the word uh, itself says, power it means there is a power to it. And when you are saying BI, it is business intelligence. When you are saying power, BI means it is business intelligence. So uh, I will be walking you through the presentation and my colleague uh, Tarun will... Uh, okay, can you make... Uh, Stephen, can you make him as co-host so that he can... No, I'm not okay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it is a Microsoft application, like what we all know about it is Microsoft Excel. This is Lilbone than Excel. It has a power in it and why it is used to generate intelligence reports. It is both desktop and web-based and the application will help you to load a lot of data, build models and create visualization. In fact, uh, in terms of various applications that exist, where does the Microsoft uh, is? It's always on the higher up in the leaderboard. 
I would call this as data analysis, visualizing reporting software. Uh, you can sign it up freely. For you to sign it up, uh, after the session, I would request people to explore this. It has desktop, it has cloud. Download the Power BI desktop for easy to use. Download Power BI desktop, easy to use. Go to this application, click on step two. You will be able to download the application and you will be able to handle it. You will be able to handle it easily. Once you open the application, let me give you how you can navigate through the Power BI. By the time that Tarun comes up and uh, we uh, see the presentation, I'll quickly walk you through how the Power BI application looks like. See, you will look like a homepage, something like this. You will you will see a homepage. Uh, if you're feeling that is too much clustered, the thing, don't worry. The crux of Power BI is these three buttons which you are seeing on to the on to my left side. The first one, the first one indicates reports, the report that you are seeing on the screen. The second one indicates the data from where the data has come or the data is coming. Third one talks about relationship, the model that you are be, uh, building up. Models, not the uh, hero, heroine models, but how you are building up. Like your Microsoft Excel, you can have multiple sheets data can be in multiple sheets and you have an interesting timeline with the adjustment of the timeline this data gets changed related automatically we will see one account live so just to once you install there are various uh, information so what are all the various information i have just given a small indication here Basically, if you have not signed up, it will say that please sign up. Use your Gmail account, sorry, use your Microsoft account or a corporate account and put a proper name. Put a proper name which is visible and you will be able to understand what, what you are talking and what we are doing. Then you have a ribbon. Then you have a ribbon this we call it as ribbon i will walk you through this ribbon i'm sure most of you have seen this ribbon while i was showing power query reports that is your point number three four five six i have explained this is the powerful actions or powerful menu of the power bi then this is the whole section this is the whole section this is the clean slate where you will create your visualization all that you will present to the management will appear but what graph to do what to do is available here on to your right you want a bar chart you want a pie chart you want a spreadsheet all that you want you want to have grouping and subgrouping you want to increase the relationship all that is available here that is available in this graph right and why I'm actually bringing it up is because in a while, Tarun is going to show you a live report so that you get familiar with uh, the whole of it. And what you have is views. So this is the raw data. You can kind of build a relationship saying that table one, table two, table three, this table connects to this table. Uh, if any one of you have prepared pivots, with multiple tables together, you will understand this relationship. Maybe we'll quickly build one relationship and show you. Finally, this is how the output would be. You will see an output in this format. You have a raw data, you build the relationship, and the output is this way. How do I get the data? You can get the data from multiple sources. You can get the data from an Excel file, flat file, text file, CSV file, or you can directly connect to uh, databases like SQL, Oracle. So you can connect anywhere, including online. You have data on the Google Sheets. You can connect the data online. Data can be connected from any source, anywhere. You can fetch and get the data. 
once you get the data what do you do you got to transform the data once you get the data you got the transform the data basically uh, m scripting this is what i we have seen so you select the transform the data you can add uh, by the way by the, if you remember every time when i was doing something there were steps that were showing up this is like a macro i click on say i click on suddenly in this button it will suddenly at this step what was the result it will keep showing i can remove it here i can do anything and whatever the query which i have created i can make a name to the query these query names can be called and further used in in multiple places so the tabs that you have seen here is home tab transform and adding columns there are various tabs that are available that you will be seeing you will get a overview understanding of the data i think this is enough to just to give you a glimpse of what it is what we will do is we'll get on to a live demo far as tarun is presenting you the the data and building a visualization we will see how it is helpful so for the purpose of this what we have taken is we have taken a manufacturing entity which is doing into component manufacturing somewhere in north india so a data actual data of that has been taken and this entity has multiple units one unit in chandigarh one in ludhiana one in delhi kolkata this has multiple entities multiple units they also have multiple uh, businesses they manufacture they also are into trading they also have uh, job work repair uh, repairing activity and everything so from the books of accounts how do i extract this information and how do i present and visualize that is what we are going to see now tarun are you ready sure. yeah can you share your screen mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You already installed yeah. the Power BI. So but this is not uh, Power BI. Yeah. yeah. So it's oh, already it's, installed. It's, uh, we will be starting from the uh, directly loading of the data. Can you just go and load the data, please? And like Microsoft Excel file shows as XLSX. Here you can see the okay. file is showing us. PB Power BI reports PBIX. So he is taking the data from an Excel file. So he has selected. He went. Uh, he went to uh, home, get data from Excel workbook. He has selected an Excel file. Book. Now Power BI is connecting to that Excel workbook. So now the data it has found that there are three sheets in that file. in that excel file there is some receipts and payment there is some all the cost basically the cost pl and as i said there is the service division the job work related data three sheets are there so he would be selecting one let's start with the say cost pl so that let's do an activity wise pl and the information is there you can load it you can transform it and you can build visualization let's uh, this this is what you are seeing the data let's first transform the data how to transform and get it in the way we want so can you can go to the next step what is the advantage of power bi right now i think the data that we are uh, uh, handling is like 1 million records now this 1 million records once you set up the whole process tomorrow next month data is added to it you just need to refresh it in the excel file you i you copy another 50000 records you refresh this all the data is automatically refreshed and presented go ahead uh, tan
Uh, it's okay even if the uh, changes are not applied discard it we can create the uh, queries uh, again click on the browser panel so basically we are in this screen this is what which i have shown in this screen where the data which is there this is where the data got loaded we will be now loading the data to the reports so we have fetched the data from microsoft excel now we will build a visualization and see how the reports would come out uh, data has not loaded can you just cross? Okay, let me take. Give me a moment. I think the screen is hanging. Maybe you can share the file to me. I will also. I can also work. Uh, Tarun, maybe you can share the file to me. We can uh, do the demo in my system only. Tarun, you are on mute. I am unable to hear. Yeah, yeah it's audible. Can you share the Excel file? Uh, maybe I'll do the demo uh, from my system itself. Okay, sir. Participant, just give, give me a moment. Let me uh, take control of the screen and. Sir, can I send you a mail? Yeah, no problem. Please send it. In the meantime, if there are any queries on the GST, please uh, share and ask the same while I set up my Power BI screen.
Okay, oh, let me share the screen. And uh, maybe Tarun, can you stop your uh, screen? Stop sharing. All right. So here we go. This is your, this is the Power BI. And like I said, uh, make sure you always log in and have a proper naming. But uh, let's now get on to the data. Let's now start working. Let me get the data. I have the data from my Microsoft Excel workbook. All right, so here is my data and I am just loading the data. So you can see the, it has connected, it is connecting to the Power BI as connected. So as I said, we will work on one report, cost analysis. So let's first transform the data. So it will, give it will basically it is taking us to power query editor the same editor which we have seen the same editor which we have seen while we were doing power query if you notice it was home button transform button and all those uh, things so i will i can make changes if i want to do otherwise right now what i'm doing is i'm just loading it only for your information i'm just showing up now I'm loading all the data here, which will assist me to create a data model. It's a one-time activity. By the way, this is around 20 MB file. I think it has uh, uh, more than, it's, it has a million uh, records because CSV files are generally purged. So first time you will have to build a model. It is like a, a pivot table, you will prepare a pivot table first. Then whenever the data is changed, you, you will have to automatically just do a button called refresh. What let us do is let us just prepare a simple uh, PNL account. Okay. I have selected a report. So I am just saying that, okay, basis my whether income or any, and this is like your power, uh, power same your pivot table. If you see on my right side, if you see on my right side, let me just highlight this. You can see rows, data, columns, value, same what you remember like a pivot table, right? So it's similar to that. It is similar to that. So I have selected the, in my rows, I want my income and expenditure. I can just bring the, uh, the group uh, whatever is there in MIA, uh, your schedule three grouping, whatever you want, you I can get that. So I can just expand, I can get all the information. So all that uh, is going to be there, right? And let me get the uh, my headers. I want to have time frame, 21, 20, 20, like multiple years. I have the data, quarter by month, I, I can simplify and get it. What do I want? I want my values, my values, uh, we, we, which uh, the turnover and everything, all that values I want. I'll just bring and drop that values. Now, can you see this is, this is like you are same like a pivot table, same like a pivot table. I have an option to do grouping both for columns and the rows. Now, what does the grouping uh, give me? So the grouping has given me, I can expand quarter, quarter over quarter. I can expand what is the turnover in 2021, 2022. Basically, this is drill down. You have, you can find the drill down of all the items, line items, all that you can find it in a detailing way. This is yeah. this is your uh, PNL account. So we have uh, presented in a detailed way. You you don't want a detailed way. You can just click on one button 
wherein you purge it or condense it, subgroup it, or get it in a detailed way. Basically, this is one report. I can always say that, okay, this is this page, I will say my profit and loss account. I And I can add one more page and I can create a new visualization. I can publish this and share it. I think it was this. Yeah. Hmm. I can also publish it and share it. So I can also, with the same data, with the same data, I can build multiple visualization. I can build a visualization. Like I want, there are uh, various uh, segments. I can, for each segment, what is my income and expenditure and what is my profit? I can get that uh, information. So for each of this segment, what I'll do is I will add, uh, let's leave the old one. So let's put one more uh, matrix and uh, let me get each of my segment and how did my... Uh, uh, segment is showing up. Mm -hmm. So if if the segment overall profit, which we have seen in the earlier thing, so you can see the uh, segment wise income and expenditure. Now, if I just change the values, basically I have taken the data from my D drive. So this was a Power BI demo file. For the ease of me change this to Yeah. So assuming this data has Jan uh, to various uh, things. And if I change the data somewhere here, instead of uh, say 92, 625, yeah, I just add, let's say two more values uh, to this record. So this is an underlying data which has been connected. I can always uh, go and refresh the values. So the power of it is this is connected and it will automatically get the new data and it can change. So now month over month, you can change the values. So this is, let's say, I will call this as segment wise report. And uh, this is uh, say MIS PNL. Now Excel file was a little larger, right? Let me save this file as uh, a demo file. Okay. Now let's see. Okay. Whether when did we save this file? Okay, we saved it in D drive as demo file. Let's just go here and uh, let's look at the size of this file. We will look at this. The Excel file was 14 MB, while my Power BI data file was only 2 MB. It is powerful. It can have like your Excel file multiple sheets. So now I can just send off this file. Now a pre-agreed uh, the management information. For example, you want to have some graph. You can also create a, uh, let's say a chart, a pie chart. So what would be my legends and my values. So I can, I can just say my turnover in each segment and their contribution, say 49 million, 41 million and segment wise, Chandigarh unit, how much it is doing, services unit, how much it is doing. 
you can create anything you want and present it to the management. So this file will be light. It has even more powerful reporting engine. Today we are only, I'm only attempting to show what it can do. We have seen getting the data from an Excel file. If you are using an organization where SAP is, is deployed, or you have your own proprietary database uh, application and SQL is there. You can connect to any of the sources, including you can get data from an ODBC. You can get a data from Tally ODBC. Data, if I let me just open and say Tally. So in the next session, we will show how I can collect Power BI through the tally and automatically prepare a PNL account. Yeah, yeah, correct. So here I can just go to other and uh, I can here is my ODBC. I will just connect to ODBC. One second. Yeah, and I will say connect. Let me. So I can just say tally ODBC and I can connect. Yeah, so you can see this is the tally name. It has connected. And uh, we can automatically load my ledger table, get my closing balance. Uh, you can do this also, right? So likewise, in the next session, we'll explore more how to build an interactive reports with the Power BI and Tally. And with the change in entry in the Tally, how my Power BI report will change. We will see that in the next session. This session was more to give an intro of what Power BI is. Just to summarize back, uh, the Power BI is a business intelligence report. And what you need to know in the Power BI is three key things, which is how to report, build various, there are a lot of various visualization, Using them, you build the visualization. You get the data source. Use this data source and get the data source. And if you want to you build multiple queries, you can build multiple queries by building the relationship between one table to other table, which is the unique key which you want to use. You can build the relationship, right? So these are the various things one needs to know about Power BI. And just start with the basic thing, sign up, download Power BI desktop, take one Excel book, load the data, and just play with it, see how the data is coming. And by the way, what we have uh, created in the live file is the data which is you, you have a table where you can get a table or a matrix, where whatever which we have selected, you can see whatever we have selected here, on the right side, it is highlighted. Right side, it is highlighted. So I've just selected a matrix. Matrix is like your pivot table. You can have as much as information that you have. And we also uh, made like uh, drilling. Do you want to have cross reports? You want to uh, go down? You can go down. Filtering is applicable. And grouping and subgrouping is applicable. Filters are like slicers. You select uh, whatever you want to see, you'll be able to see, right? Of course, if anything which I say now more, it is like too much uh, load on, uh, on you. But just to start with, I want to give an introduction. Power BI is a powerful reporting tool. Uh, initially, it might, apply, uh, uh, it might appear it to be as a complicator to you. Start preparing your reports which are presenting to the management in the Power BI format. Then you will start appreciating multiple visualizations that you can do. And the 
like you all know the chat gpt got introduced you can actually get involved in making use of multiple data so you can get into any of the data sources and uh, the microsoft is becoming very strong in how you can analyze the data and present the data so any questions to any participants on the power bi Yeah, so Bhuvana is asking, can you show how to get the ribbon? Yeah, Bhuvana, they were, it's pre, uh, pretty simple. Once you load the data, this is automatic. Okay, maybe for you, this is uh, collapsed and it would be like this, people for the first time. So this, you got to expand this. Basically, what you need is visualization. Select which visualization you want and what field you want to select in this table, what field you want to select, you use that. How does it compare with the Tableau, Vinod? Uh, very good question. See, Tableau, I will rate it as, uh, uh, since this has been designed more for uh, the reporting, Tableau is excellent, but cost is little high or pretty high for a user. Power BI comes free. The basic version comes free for use. Only when you want to publish and you want to create, you need to have a subscription. And today the licensing of it, uh, I think in the Microsoft Office 365, the basic subscription, you will get it. And is there a difference between Power Query in Excel and the Power BI? Both are same. The, it's an M scripting. Both are uh, the same. Yeah. All right. Any other questions to the participants? Okay, great. So with this, we have come to end of uh, today's session. Uh, I thank uh, Ashika, Jagdish, Tarun for putting up all the data, presenting it to us in an informative way and uh, hoping to see you soon. Uh, I'm here for some more time. If you have any questions, any questions on the GST other than GST or uh, the one which we discussed today, we can discuss. Okay, so there being no questions, I think it's the time to say goodbye. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, at the end of the session, we will be sending you a feedback, a link with the feedback form. Once you fill the feedback, you will get a file, whatever the today's session, the presentations that we have given both on the Power BI and on the uh, GST, you can get a link to download. And please write to us whatever the topics that you interested to uh, know. We will include that in our upcoming session. In fact, one last time there was a request came up that can you just enlighten us with all the TDS related provisions because over the time people would have forgot. So we thought we'll include the same in the upcoming uh, uh, session. So Bhuvana is saying we have tried Power BI, all fields are not coming. How to see the same? Uh, I think maybe write to me, we'll connect offline or if we, I have time, you can share your screen. I can just see, show you, uh, guide you how to enable that, uh, how it is not coming. We can see that also. I'm okay with the both. You can show, uh, connect it live now or we can connect it offline, Bona. And I request everyone uh, to keep attending the sessions uh, so that you are up to date with the subject and uh, any topic that you think you want to get uh, to be updated about, please put uh, write to us. We will include in our upcoming session. Every month we conduct uh, this session and also we, we send monthly newsletter about the GST updates. In case if you are not getting a, an email from us, uh, again, write to me. We will include your email ID in our uh, email a monthly newsletter subscription. Yeah. It's 5.30. On this note, we will end the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.